Howdy ho, people. This is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two girls, one ghost. I don't know why we went a little bit like country over her. <laughs> we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne and I'm Sabrina. And this is an Encounters Hi. episode where we read your paranormal spooky ghost stories that you email us. And mm-hmm. we just put our reading comprehension and ability to read generally to the test. It's not great. We probably should redo Hooked on Phonics. Yeah. <laughs> And practice reading aloud. For how many years we've been doing this, you would think we'd be better at it. But the beauty of editing is that you don't realize how bad we are at it. So I guess maybe if there are any kids out there and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed to read aloud. I hate reading aloud. Here's the thing. We all do. It's okay. You're amongst, there are very few pro readers out there. Is that a profession? A pro? I guess that like people who do like audio books and stuff are pro readers. Yeah, they don't stumble nearly as much. But even mm. they have editing. So it's just true. don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. I also don't like talking. So um, this is a difficult thing then. <laughs> but the thing is that I'm better <laughs> at writing. So I can write my ideas down and regurgitate a little bit better than yeah, putting myself true. on the spot to come up with thoughts because that is where I struggle. It is harder. Yeah. My writing voice is totally, totally different. Well, not that different, but. It's your internal monologue. Yeah. My internal monologue doesn't forget words. My mouth does. Right. It's the the disconnect. What do you do with your hour break, Corinne? I ate a Greek salad and then I immediately wanted something sugary. So I put some chocolate chips and peanut butter in a mug and I heated it up and then I ate that liquid. (gasps) And then uh, a paint sample came in for the sunroom, Pigeon Mm -hmm. by Pharaoh and Ball. And I put it on the wall and then I think I decided I just want it to be white. (laughs) (laughs) You made some decisions. That's good. Yeah, that's what I did. What did you do? I watched TikTok for the first time in like forever because I was just like, I have been waking up so early and an hour felt like, I don't know, sometimes an hour. It's like there's not a ton that I can get done right now. No, and you can't get yourself in the flow because I feel like we both kind of have the ADHD thing going where it's like when you're focused, you can't be taken. Like, I'm like, no one speak to me because then you'll, you'll, it's done. I can't right. do what I was supposed to do. And then I will never me. go back to it until yeah. I get back into it again. And it yes. takes hours and hours. Yeah, totally. I would like to just toot my own horn for a second, though, because I had a bunch of uh, girlfriends over last night, kind of, and this is, we're recording this in April, but prior to my moving to the East Coast. And it was really nice to hear my friends say, this is like one of the nicest things that I've ever heard from like anyone that they said that they've seen me in the last two years be a very indecisive person. And then the last couple of months, they've seen me be so certain and clear with my decision making. And I was like, therapy works. Therapy works. And not just normal decisions, big decisions. Big decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, oh, do you want to go to this party or not? It's a move across the country. Yeah. It is decisions about people in your lives, places in your lives. Lives, multiple lives that I have. (laughs) Your current life, your future life, you're making decisions for both of you. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I realized that my TikTok, because I haven't been on TikTok in a really long time, but it is so geared towards like my inner child healing because all of the videos are dads with young daughters, like having these like really beautiful moments together. And I'm like, clearly, that's what I've, (laughs) it's targeting me. I wonder why I'm getting these. Interesting. Yeah. Nothing like the algorithm figuring you out pretty much immediately. It's truly. Okay, but we have ghost stories for you today. We'll talk about my childhood trauma another day. Do you want to start? Sure. 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 Okay. Okay. This is called Zombie Ghosts Have Great Taste in Homes. Um, we sang that earlier. And after I just gave a spiel about how I'm not good at reading, this is a rather long one. So hopefully I suffer less than expected. Good okay. luck. I need it. Hello, fellow ghostesses. I've always been such an extrovert, but since entering my 30s, I've been turning more into an introvert, Welcome. finally tackling all the books on my shelves. I think I'm also the extrovert turned introvert. I know you identify as an introvert, but I really do think that you're more extroverted than I am now. You do much better at social situations. Maybe in the last year I have been because I've been putting myself out there a little bit more, but I'm moving to the East Coast and we're going to be two very introverted introverts. (laughs) I guess that's true. All the excuses to go out have left you. Yes. I'm finally tackling all of the books on my shelves. 
I have amazing friends who luckily have been understanding and many going through their own fatigue inducing transformations as well with kids and with partners. And sometimes I want to be social without being social, you know, (laughs) LOL. Yeah. And listening to you both talk makes me feel like I'm hanging out with my girlfriends, drinking wine, trading ghost stories. It gives me energy and joy. So thank you so much. And you don't have to exert much energy, which is great. We're happy to help you. It's you perfect. can just sit back and relax. And I feel like we feel you listening. We do. So like we are. We're all there. <laughs> we're all watching you. I've experienced some spooky things growing up, and some people in my family have as well. But for today, I wanted to share about my friend John and his haunted AF gorgeous home here in the classiest city on earth, San Diego. Mm-hmm. In the late 1700s, Spanish missions were built here many with the use of forced labors from Native Americans, including the children. Aside Mm -hmm. from the mistreatment, European diseases also led to the mass death of the, I know I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but Kumiye, and it easily spread by the small quarters of the settlements that they forced them to live in. In Old Town, bodies from the 1800s are everywhere. If you look down at the sidewalk and roads, you will see small markers for each of the 477 bodies. Presidio Park is up on a hill with grass and trees, and families come to picnic, but it's also well known that this is laid out over another cemetery. I've had friends visiting say that they get a really uneasy feeling in this area before even knowing about its history. The park is pretty big. They have some areas that have unearthed ruins, stone walls, and ovens from the 17 and 1800s. There's also an old guard tower from that time, and it was nicknamed the Witch's Tower. And when it was repaired, the owner of the building decided to put a pentagram on top due to the name. That doesn't seem like a good idea. (laughs) This is the one thing about witches. I feel like immediately there's this connection between witches and Satan and that that's just not true. That's a stereotype that doesn't necessarily exist. Definitely not. I think a lot of people who are using, yeah, we don't need to get into it. We've talked about it before. Right. And other witches have come to the table to tell us about it. Since then, the area has clearly been used by the occult. There are always wax stains from candles and dark stains in the middle of the pentagram from rituals. One year they found, oh God, this is trigger warning for death. (laughs) One year they found a woman murdered up there with a goat pendant laid near her. Oh my God. It's a pretty heavy place if you ever visit. And then we have a photo that they are including of the pentagram for people to see it. Whoa. Okay. There's a lot more spooky history. The Hotel de Coronado. Mount Woodson Castle, the Villa Montezuma, and the Whaley House voted the most haunted place in America, which we have covered. This all being said, it came as no surprise to me that my friend John's home, a historic landmark, one of the very first homes built in San Diego, would be haunted. Whoa, one of the very first homes built in San Diego? That's cool. Historic. Also, if you do hear background noise, it is a nail gun. It is not a demon knocking on the wall. It sounds a little bit like a woodpecker saying hello to you. It does kind of sound like a woodpecker (laughs) in the distance. Yeah. My friend John is very social. He loves hosting themed parties. Whenever I would go, I would notice that even though the kitchen is huge and lovely, it's filled with food, people would never linger in there. Mm. They would grab their food and they would quickly move back into the living room areas. At first, I figured this was just normal, but when I would go to other parties, people would linger in all of the rooms. It was just at John's where things were different. I did feel a bit weird in his kitchen, like someone was watching me. Same thing when I would use the bathroom that was next to the kitchen, but I just always brushed it off. One day, when I was hanging out with John, I mentioned my observations to him, and he hadn't felt anything strange in the rooms, but had also noticed that people never lingered in the kitchen area. John said that he did have some spooky home features to show me, and he led us to the kitchen where one of the central walls was made of brick. There hanging was a large decorative dish. He removed it to reveal a gaping hole. It leads down to the crawl space underneath the house, he said. He explained it like it was just there due to how the ovens were installed back in the day. So I dared him to stick his hand in it with his phone and record a video to see if there was anything down there. And he laughed and he obliged. But all I saw was darkness and dust particles blowing across the flash. There had been a strange smell coming from down below, and John noticed it too. It may be an animal... That may have died down there. There are raccoons and skunks outside sometimes, and I do see motion lights come on a lot. Mm. John then led us to the bathroom next to the kitchen. I always hated this bathroom. You walk in and there's a sink, a shower, a window, another door. You walk in that door and there's a small room just big enough for the toilet. And directly to the right of the toilet is a small latched door. 
John unlatched that small door by the toilet, revealing a winding staircase down to the basement. I followed him down the steps, and then I jumped at what I saw. Terrifying, isn't it? John laughed. There, standing in the middle of the small basement, was a Trump pinata. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, very, I said. Looking around, the walls were unfinished. About three feet at the top of the walls was just open, made of dirt, an endless dark crawl space. John flashed his light into it, and we couldn't see anything but the dirt in the darkness. I probably have to crawl in there tomorrow and fish whatever it is out, he said. I could not believe how calm he sounded. There was no way in hell anyone could get me to go in there. I wonder how long it had been since anyone had gone in the crawl space. It also, it, there's, it's kind of scary how many gaping holes there are to this crawl space. Right. I mean, it sounds like John lives alone, too, and he probably was not opening these holes and examining these things. Right. Later, John did admit that it was pretty terrifying for him, sliding in there, shuffling around. But what mostly terrified him was the dead possum and having to drag it out. Okay, so they did find a dead animal. Hmm. Creepy things would continue to happen at John's home. I came over with my corgi, Thimble, and Thimble has a nickname, Hoover, because he's like a Hoover vacuum. He just (laughs) sucks up and eats everything. Food, paper, a marble, anything. His motto is eat first, ask questions later. (laughs) Oh, nimble. Quite opposite from my German shepherd who will spit out his organic chicken. He'll push it around with his little nose and make sure that it's up to par before gingerly eating it as if it may still be poisonous. Oh. John welcomed Thimble with some pieces of rotisserie chicken, which of course he inhaled without even tasting. And John went back to the kitchen for more. That is, until he reached the doorway of the kitchen. And then Thimble abruptly stopped. John called him to follow, but Thimble just looked at him, pattering his feet a little as if he was thinking about it. It was so strange for him to not come when called, especially when food was involved. Yeah. I laughed. What's the matter with you? I got up and I followed John into the kitchen. Come on, come here, Thimble. I called in the most upbeat puppy voice, hitting my thighs. Thimble and I were very bonded. He's never once not come when I have called him. He whined and he barked at me, a high-pitched, nervous, and frustrated bark. What is it? It's safe in here. Come on. Come here, Thimble. He paced outside the doorway nervously. He would not cross the threshold. I held a juicy piece of chicken and I bent down, continuing to beckon him, but he only became more upset, barking frantically. Finally, I walked over to him and I gave it to him. Okay, we don't have to go in the kitchen, I said. The rest of the time at John's, Thimble was fine. He was happy, cuddly, scouting for food. But he never once went into that kitchen. Another time, I was hanging out with John and another friend of mine, Danielle, just talking about boys and dating. By the way, John is still single. So if you know anyone interested in a hot architect with a haunted house and beautiful views of Balboa Park. Wow, that, <laughs> nice. you are a good friend. <laughs> We're casting a wide Leia, net here. Are you volunteering? <laughs> She's like, I hear there's food there. There's rotisserie <laughs> chicken. I want that juicy chicken thigh. I excused myself to go to the restroom, the creepy one next to the kitchen. And I walked into the first room with the sink and the shower, and I shut the door. Then I stepped into the second room that had the toilet. I thought about shutting that door too, but looking over at the small door to the right that led to the basement, I thought, hell no. And I left the door in front of me open. I didn't want to be trapped in that tiny room with that little creepy door right there. Then as I was sitting, I heard the door to the bathroom. The door I had shut and locked over by the sink began to rattle. I'm almost done, I called out. It was quiet for a second. Then someone tried the handle again. I'm in here still. Sorry. I quickly flushed and I washed my hands. I unlocked and opened the door, but no one was there. I walked back out into the living room area to the far left of the home. And I said, hey, I'm done. And I sat down. Do you need to go use it still? John and Danielle looked at me confused. Huh? No, John said. The bathroom? No, I'm okay. Did something fall in there? Danielle asked. No, I said. Why? I thought I heard like a thump sound and then you were saying something, Danielle continued. I shook my head. No, I didn't drop anything. Wasn't one of you trying to come into the bathroom? They insisted that they were not. And I explained Mm -hmm. what had happened and they both looked just as creeped out as I was now feeling. To this day, years later, they swear that they never did anything. And I think I believe them, but I guess I may never really know. But I still get that same bad feeling when I'm in the bathroom as I do in the kitchen. My friend John often rents out the other rooms in his large home. For a few months, he was having a hard time renting out one of the upstairs rooms that has stairs leading to the finished attic. It's a really nice space. You could have your bedroom in a large white attic and the windows and the skylight. 
The stairs lead down to a large room with a fireplace and large windows all around to use as your own personal living room area. Wow. As the room had a door that locked to make sure that the two rooms were private to whomever would rent them. I will say the attic had walls that slid to reveal some open spaces for storage. And that part was creepy as hell because who wants to know that their bedroom walls have potential hidden passages and hiding places? Still, it was a pretty cool spot and it was for a great price. I mean, also, if you have like a cool attic room, there's very rarely a lot of storage. So the fact that there is storage, I don't know, it's with like the big room with the fireplace. It sounds amazing. I agree. And also, I feel like I know exactly what those look like, where they're kind of like low. I'm picturing kind of like an A-frame sort of situation, Mm -hmm. some sort of vaulted ceiling. So they're, they're just low. It is creepy, though, having a little crawl space. Also, I'm curious, like, what room in this house does not have creepy vibes? I know. Yeah. John said that he couldn't get anyone to want to rent this place. When he did finally have a man who was interested, they moved in all of their stuff, spent one night, and then abruptly packed up and left the next day, (gasps) saying that they actually decided they could not afford the rent after all. Then another man moved in. Same thing happened. After spending one night, he said his mother was ill and he needed to move out and go care for her. I was listening intently on the sofa as he admitted to me, I'm starting to wonder if maybe it really is haunted. Then, as if someone had been listening in, we heard what sounded like a metal spoon fall on the floor above our heads. Something upstairs in that room had fallen. Hmm. Is there anybody up there now? I asked. No, John said. There isn't anything in the room to fall. I noticed my back was stinging a little bit, but I didn't really think anything of it. We continued talking for a time, and eventually I decided it was time for me to go back to bed. I was getting ready to shower. In my bathroom, I have two mirrors so I can check the back of my hair when I'm styling it. And I glanced up and I saw my back in the mirror and my mouth dropped. There, down my back was a single long red scratch mark. The width of the scratch was like it had been caused by a fingernail. And it wasn't a straight line. It moved a bit jaggedly near my spine, just from below the base of my neck, almost all the way down to my hips. I remembered how much my back had been stinging at John's as we sat there on the sofa, and I'd felt it after hearing that thing fall upstairs, and there was no explanation for the scratch. I took a photo of my back and I sent it to John. He immediately called me back asking what in the world had happened. I laughed in amazement and I told him I had no idea. Eventually, John was able to rent the rooms out to a woman and her dog. If something works for the ghost, why change it? So I guess a woman and her dog is the answer to appease this ghost. No men. I love all things spooky, obviously. I love you girls. So I thought it would be fun for me and Danielle to spend the night at John's house. The rooms upstairs had been rented out, so we slept in the living room below, the same room that I had received the mysterious scratch in. There were two sofas, and Danielle said that there was no way she was sleeping on one that didn't have any armrests because it left you too exposed to whatever demons may be lurking. So I laughed, and I said I would take it. But I was feeling just as terrified at that prospect. Looking down at my feet as I laid there, I could see down into the other large rooms. Her sofa not only had armrests, it was also on the enclosed side of the room. My sofa was by a large open entryway, so you could literally see into the entire entry hall, the dining room beyond that, the sunroom, the backyard beyond that. And from my angle, I could see the spooky bathroom and the spooky kitchen. John came down and he closed the two large sliding wooden doors to the dining room. At least then it was just the entryway and the creepy bathroom and the kitchen that I could see now. He said goodnight and he headed upstairs. His bedroom was on the second floor on the opposite side of the home from us. Surrounded by shadows, I tried not to look back down at my feet. I could feel myself starting to get sweaty from the nerves. And from out of the stillness, I heard Danielle say, I had no idea how creepy it would feel. I'm legit scared and kind of regretting this. We both laughed nervously. Yeah, I agreed. I love that they're having like a creepy paranormal investigation slash like submitting themselves willingly to a house that they are both already scared of. And it's their friend's house. And Josh is like upstairs. It's his regular residence. (laughs) He's like, good night, friends. Wow. I closed my eyes. I noticed a light behind my lids. So I opened my eyes to see the motion sensor lights outside had now come on. I opened my eyes again, annoyed, and the room we were in was surrounded by windows except for by the fireplace, and the lights were going on and off all at different parts from outside of the room. I was picturing us slowly being surrounded by an army of vengeful possums. Then the kitchen light clicked on. My eyes darted down to the kitchen, and from my angle, I couldn't see much into the kitchen, but I did see the yellow wall of the kitchen. So I stared, and I started to listen. Had John come downstairs without my noticing? I'd heard nothing. 
Then the kitchen light shut off again. I closed my eyes. I pulled the blanket over my head. I was still sweating, but I didn't care. Everyone knows blankets over your head are demon proof, right? (laughs) I was just going to stay like this all night. I knew I wouldn't get any sleep, but I was okay with that as long as I wasn't demon chow. (laughs) I kept listening and I still heard nothing. Then gradually came the sound of groaning like zombies. It must be the neighbor's TV, I thought. Danielle woke up and asked me if I could hear the strange sounds too. I told her that we could just go back to sleep. It was someone's TV. I don't think it is, she said. It sounds like it's coming from inside. Danielle then pointed towards the dark, open rooms. I'm not sure how I knew, but I could just tell that this was different from the other strange things that I had been experiencing. But despite the creepy groans, it didn't elicit any feelings. That is, until I stood up to investigate for her. Uh Uh-oh. As soon as I stood up, the volume got louder, way louder, and I felt surrounded by the sound. My heart raced, but somehow I still knew that this was different, so I picked up my phone and I called John. A sleepy-sounding John answered the phone. Yes? You guys okay down there? John, I know this is you. John played dumb at first, but I stuck to my guns. Eventually, John caved, and he admitted that this was a prank. He came downstairs laughing. I was playing a YouTube video called Zombie Sounds. And he walked over to the dining room, sliding open the large wooden doors again and picking up an iPad that he had hidden behind them. John, that's so mean. I felt so relieved. It must have been John in the kitchen, too, I thought. After that, Danielle and I were able to both fall back to sleep and sleep through the night. The next morning when we were talking about John's prank, I mentioned how I should have known because he'd come downstairs and I saw the kitchen light turn on. And John said, no, I was able to control it from my room. I placed the tablet there when I first closed the doors. I waited until I figured you might be asleep and then I turned it on. But from my bedroom, I couldn't hear it. So I wasn't sure if it was working. So I just started to turn up the noise. The timing of that is funny. That it was exactly when AJ got up. Well, your timing was perfect. It had been right as I stood up that it got loud. We all laughed and John never admitted to the kitchen light. He said maybe it was a light from outside of the house, one of the sensors, and that maybe it was just looking like it was coming on in the kitchen. But this was not an outside light. It was most definitely the kitchen light. It had clicked Mm. on and it lit up the whole kitchen and it stayed on until it was clicked back off. Again, to this day, years later, John has never said anything about the kitchen that night. And when I called him, he had been in his room on the opposite side of the house. I saw him come down the stairs, and these stairs are old and they're squeaky, and I was way too hypervigilant that night to have missed him coming down and then going. I don't know what has changed in the past years, but it doesn't really feel dark in there like it used to. Hmm. I've even noticed people hanging out in the kitchen again. I asked John if he did anything, like sage the house, but he swears he hasn't done anything. It's probably one of his tenants, I bet. One of the tenants is doing some cleansing. Like, I I wonder if it's that woman and her dog because they were the the only people who seemed to be okay staying there. Right. And then the next person who rented was another woman and her dog. Yeah. Or maybe it's just like that's how you appease the spirits. They love dogs. (laughs) Women and dogs, but not Hoover. Poor guy. Little thimble. I hope you enjoyed. I apologize if it's a bit long. Don't apologize. It was very entertaining. Keep up the awesome work. Stay spooky. Stay safe. AJ. I will say what I love about this story is that AJ's gut instincts are so spot on and in tune because AJ, despite being afraid of the kitchen and like the bathroom and having had all these experiences where they trusted their gut, now at the night where they were staying the night where AJ and Danielle were sleeping downstairs, AJ knew that the sound of the zombies wasn't something bad. Yeah, it was just different enough. It like didn't feel paranormal enough. It didn't feel like it was... Echoing from the chambers of the in-between. Yeah. Trust your gut, AJ. Trust your gut. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But I do feel bad for Hoover. I am glad that the other dogs that, like, actually had to live there were not experiencing anything spooky in their apartment. I agree. And now I'm really curious about this house and the layout and how the functionality of the apartments. Invite us over. We want to go to John's house. It sounds creepy. It does. Well, there's a house that you won't want to go to. And because, well, now it no longer exists, but ghosts wanted to destroy it. Oh, okay. This is from our listener, Ashton, and it is called, Is This Ghost Trying to Burn People Alive? Oh my God. Hi, girls. My friend Caitlin recently showed me the podcast and I've been obsessed ever since. This story isn't actually mine. It's my mom and her cousins. When my mom was growing up, her and her family lived in a haunted house. This is all happening in the 80s for reference. 
So this house was in the town my family is from and has lived in forever. It was on some land and kind of off on its own from the rest of the neighborhood. Before my mom and her parents ever moved in, there was a lady who lived there and she ended up, I'm going to, I should say trigger warning. There's a lot of like death with fire. Okay. So before my mom and her parents ever moved in, there was a lady who lived there and really tragically ended up burning to death outside while burning trash. A few years later, my mom and her parents moved in. My mom is a skeptic, so she says that she never saw anything, but one of her cousins claimed that one night during a sleepover, she woke up and saw a figure of a woman in a white nightgown walking down the stairs. And then the next occurrence was during a routine cousin sleepover. My mom's cousin said she was asleep while my mom had a Dolly Parton tape playing. And it started making this warping sounds. And then all of a sudden, my grandma came running in and told them they all had to get out of the house because that Dolly Parton tape had caught fire. (gasps) Not Dolly Parton. This was not the last time it would happen. The second time, my mom said it was just her and my grandparents sitting around the living room when a log rolled out of the wood-burning stove and burnt a hole in the carpet. The final time, this house caught fire. It burned to the ground completely. Years later, once I was in the picture, one of my friends was living in a new house that was built on that same piece of land. One night, my friend said she woke up to a woman in a white nightgown standing at the edge of her bed. She said the woman didn't say a word, but looked at her and left the room. So my friend followed her through the house until this woman (gasps) disappeared. Oh my gosh, I have chills. How brave. How brave. I asked my friend what she looked like, and she said that everything on her was singed like she had been burned. Oh God. We didn't know about the history of this place until after this happened. Her younger sister also had really bad nightmares at this time and would sleepwalk all over the house and outside in the middle of the night. This is kind of reminding me of Haunting of Hill House with like the Lady of the Lake and yeah. people just becoming a little bit possessed and sleepwalking and in a trance. 100%. Especially the following the lady. Like I wonder mm-hmm. if her sister was sleepwalking following the lady. It was so bad my friend's parents made her sister sleep in their room. And once I left the house, all the nightmares and sleepwalking stopped. After getting info from my mom, I also found out that a man in the 90s was murdered in the house that was built on the land after my mom's house burned down. So there's a lot of death that happened here. I also wanted to add that my grandparents ended up splitting up and both lived in two different houses in the same town years later. Both of their houses, independent of each other, ended up burning down. It's just crazy. This is so wild. Yeah. I'm not sure if any of this is related, but I do think it's pretty crazy that the house has burned so many times after so many crazy things happened. I have a theory that the lady who died from being burnt to death is mad that people are living on our land and is haunting people who live there. I'm not sure, but I had to share. Keep doing what you guys do. Stay spooky, Ashton. I don't understand what's going on because at first I was like, oh, maybe something really horrific had happened here, which we know there was. And it just like that house as it was... I wasn't sure if it had been like fully rebuilt or if there was just something still there that was like connected to the woman dying. I thought perhaps they just wanted that house to burn down. But then when the house was rebuilt, the lady in the white with the singed skin is still appearing. More fire play, more people who were related to the house experiencing house fires. And also the fact that the house fires happened again to Ashton's grandparents When they moved? Right, right. It's not even on the property. It's just like, if you've been here before. I mean, they're just very fortunate for having experienced so many house fires that everyone was okay in their family, in Ashton's family. Because- My God. That's so scary. That's terrifying. It does make me think kind of of the ghost TV show where each ghost kind of have has a thing that they can do or- Mm -hmm. causes interaction with the human world like what if this poor spirit just accident like they're a fire starter in the afterlife which is sad like they have no control of it yeah i wonder if there's some weird connection where it's like every time someone puts lilies in the house the ghost is allergic to lilies (laughs) she'd sneeze and then that would like start a fire in some way sneezes fire well i i kind of hope it's that and it's totally accidental because otherwise it's kind of strange to try to inflict the same horrors that you experienced in your own life and death into death on so many people. It's not just once to try to like understand what happened to you. It's again and again and again. I know. It's scary. Oh my gosh, Ashton, y'all are alive and that is what is important. Yes. I'm glad. I have an email called Colorado Shadow People. 
Hey ladies, my name is Suki and I've been listening to you ghoulies for years and years and I just love you guys. I'm a witch as well as a medium and psychic so I've always been super sensitive to spirits and I have too many stories to share since I was itty bitty. I've been meaning to send you guys some of these stories but I actually think that I have sent one or two already but I can't remember. (laughs) (laughs) Neither can we. I actually started my own paranormal podcast called Gasp Ghost Adventures and Spooky Phenomenon. And since I had to type out a few of my own ghost stories for the podcast, I decided, hey, I should just send them to girlies. Any hoodle. I love you guys a ton. Thank you so much for always keeping it creepy. Thank you for listening. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I saw you guys on your tour at Cervantes, and it was so spooky and so fun. I'm so glad Denver and Cervantes could show up and show out on all of the resident spooks. That one. It was that was a creepy. great final show. Yeah. This is my mountain motel story. My first story is from when I was probably around 12 or 13 because I grew up in South Colorado Springs, Colorado. We were only a few hours away from the mountains and our family's favorite ski mountain, Monarch, in Salida. So during the winters, most weekends, especially the long ones, we went skiing and we would stay out there for a whole weekend. There was this cute little old lodge that was run by a sweet old lady and I can't remember the exact name, but there were these adorable pink colored motel rooms all together shaped in a boxy looking sea. One long weekend, we'd gotten up to the mountain late, and because of that, we left the mountain late, and we had gotten to the motel late. On this weekend, it was warmer, thus it was a more popular weekend. We weren't given our usual suite by the hot tub, but instead, we had one all the way on the other side of the parking lot towards the forest and the road. We'd eaten at the corner store, we forged dinner on our beds, (laughs) and it was me on my own bed next to the window and door of the room. My parents were sleeping on the bed next to the sink and counter and bathroom, to the left of it. And there was a TV in between the two beds and about two or three feet of space between the TV and the table and the beds. After the first day of snowboarding, after eating and showering, we all fell asleep to TV, none of us turning it off. The next thing I remember, I was awakened, not from a dream or from seemingly anything outside. No, it was one of those feelings like when you have a friend wake you up by calling your name, but not really hearing them. I had opened my eyes easily and clearly without heaviness or drowsiness like I'd been awake the whole time, but I knew I wasn't. I was looking at the wall under the window, remembering slowly where I was, and I looked at the door, and then suddenly I felt dread all over me. Oh no. I slowly let my eyes scan the bedroom, dragging from the door over to the table and then the mirror, when suddenly my eyes fell on a hooded shadow person standing at the left corner of the end of my bed. They were at least six feet and as wide as any person. My whole body tensed in seeing this. My eyes carefully gazed over them, trying to piece together what to do, when I could feel my throat tighten and become too dry and dare a single whimper or scream. (gasps) Oh no. Wait, that's like really scary because it's just like beyond sleep paralysis. It's almost like being strangled. Yeah. Gathering my breath into a solid, consistent pace, I decided to just turn over and look at my parents that were merely two feet away in the other bed. As I painfully and slowly inched onto my side, my gaze suddenly befell a much shorter hooded figure standing right next to my bed, right next to my face. And at this point, I'm staring directly into the darkest dark that I've ever seen, blacker than any night sky or windowless room. At this time, I was entirely stunned by fear and confusion. And at this point in my life, I was rather familiar with spirits and assumed that this must have been a spirit or a ghost trapped in the motel. Mm. So taking the deep, powerful breath that I could. I closed my eyes and I slowly rolled to the other side of the bed (laughs) towards the door. I took my flip phone off of the counter and with another brave breath, I ran behind the tall shadow figures at the foot of the bed towards the bathroom, slamming the bathroom door behind me as quickly as I could. And then I remember just curling up at the bathtub and hiding there until I fell asleep and I was found by my mother the next day. I love that they didn't try to wake up their parents. Yeah. And just also no. left their parents with the ghosts. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, everyone for You're himself. You're on your own. I remember that my mom asked me what happened and if I was okay, and I told her that I refused to sleep in that room ever again. My mom asked the lady running the place if we could switch rooms, and luckily someone had left that morning. Aww. She never asked or pushed me for details, but years later, I did end up coming clean about what happened that night, and I remember her believing me instantly. I asked her why she believed me so easily, and she told me that in my whole life, I have never slept anywhere that didn't have pillows or blankets in plenty. But to find me knocked out in a cold bathtub with nothing but a phone, she knew something must have really shook me and disturbed me to be in there. Oh, 
She always made sure to never let us stay in that specific room if we ever went back to the pink motel, which always meant a lot to me. It's so curious that it was just in this one room and they had stayed there so many times. I know. Like what happened in that room? Someone must have done something in that room. This is a hard thing about hotels and motels and places like Airbnbs because you never know what people do in them. Right. There's so many people coming and going and like, this is the room off the beaten path, like in terms of right. the distance of the room. Like this is the private one. This is the quiet one. This is on the edge of the woods. It's not the one that everyone's gathering by the hot tub. Like, woo, woo. Right. What's that show that maybe you told me about it, but or we've talked about on HBO. It's about a hotel room. It's a series, but like every episode's kind of different because but it's all about the same hotel room and just like p- different people staying in it. Did you tell me about that? I haven't watched if I it. I told you about it. I don't remember. Okay. But that sounds really remember. interesting. This feels like the first remember. time I'm hearing about it. <laughs> okay. Can't remember what it's called. So someone help us. Mm. But And I haven't watched it either. So I don't know if it's good, but it's an interesting concept. I'll add it to my list. Okay. My ongoing list. <laughs> my next story is my own scariest experience with a shadow shapeshifter when I was about 16 years old. My friends, Jepsum and Anna and I were all staying at Jepsum's house, which was this really beautiful big house that looks like it should be on a beach or a lake. And it was technically on a small lake on a golf course. (laughs) That counts. Yeah, it does. It had this amazing deck that was huge. And it had this really cool tower balcony spot with a fire pit. And because Jepsum's parents or siblings were rarely home during this time, we would always just stay there on weekends at her place, spending warm summer nights listening to music, making s'mores, and honestly, just ripping copious amounts of bong loads as we did so. (laughs) (laughs) One night, as we enjoyed our Mary Jane and spilling the hot goss of the time, we also loved to discuss the spooky and haunted experiences that we'd had together. We would also notice that when we did this, it would trigger more spooky stuff to happen. For a time, we actually had a rule that we're not allowed to talk about anything spooky because it became so prevalent. But those are stories for another time. Anyways, as we were talking about how bizarre something was, one of us spotted strange floating lights that bobbed along the golf course pathway near the carts. Turning around to look, we realized that it looked like two flashlights, perhaps an adult and a small child, but it seemed like they were searching for something or for someone because they kept looking back behind them and scanning around them, almost like they were hearing a voice call out in the night. It was Mm. odd because we were decently close, but we couldn't really hear them. As we watched the two slowly disappear down the pathway, I turned back around, curious, and I saw another light bobbing along, also shorter, childlike height. Me thinking that this could be a lost child separated the child caregiver and me jumped up and I convinced Anna to come down with me to see if we could help this kid find their guardian. The small light was bobbing at the beginning of the pathway when we made our way off the deck and down the small hill to the pathway from the house. By the time we made it to the pathway, the light that we had seen had now vanished. I walked back towards where it came from and we ran up the path and we just could not find the other two lights either. Making our way back to the house, me and Anna began talking about how odd it was that they all just disappeared so quickly. That is really weird. I also had begun to tell her that she needed to take it easy on Jepsum. You see, at this time, the three of us were obsessed with ghost hunting and horror movies and demons and scaring each other. And Anna had a bit at the time that she loved to do, partly because she was so great at being a character actor and mostly because it really freaked Jepsum out when she did it. (laughs) It was this bit, which also partly had some truth to it, which made it scary, of course, but Anna's father was a minister who had been a missionary and had performed exorcisms on people that were believed to be possessed by demons. We need to hear these stories. Oh my God. Yes. She told us all of this as though she believed she could actually speak with them and understand demons. She would then Uh pretend to speak with demons and every now and then suddenly slip out of demon to English, offering us what horrible things the demon wanted with us. Anna, my gosh, what a spooky girl. (laughs) I know. I mostly thought it was funny. Something about me was just so into the parody and jest. It really spooked Jepsum, though. And so Anna would end up targeting her. So I was telling her that she should really just take it easy on Jepsum because she was getting really scared and uncomfortable. In return, Anna turns away from me and then suddenly speaks with that demon that apparently appeared next to us. So she sits on a log and she commits to the bit again. Oh my gosh, Anna. (laughs) Not the time. Irritated by her devotion to the joke, I turned around to look out to the lake and out in front of me, the ground goes straight up from the pathway and then the hills downwards become grass and shrubs down until it becomes sand and rock and then the lake. 
Right in front of me, when I turned, I saw a dark silhouette figure seeming to sit on top of the hill. The figure was sitting with their knees up and their arms resting on top. Their face was facing maybe like a third away, so I could kind of see their face, but kind of not. And because they were sitting on the hill sloping down, it looked like it was maybe a child or a tween. Startled by them, I jumped and I awkwardly gave a shaky, oh, uh, hey there. I was about to ask if they were a lost kid when as soon as I finished those words, the figure slowly turned its head and looked at me. And this stopped my words, my brain, my heart, my blood. Dread enveloped me. The shadow figure moved from its sitting position to jumping straight up in the air and landing on all fours like a bear. But it still looked like a person, but this time it was much taller. It was much larger. And as soon as it landed on all four limbs, it looked so twisted and disturbing. And it began to run at me. I remember screaming bloody murder and I started to run backwards and turning forward. I stumbled. I dropped my phone. I almost tripped. I ran harder, desperately trying to run away fast. And suddenly I tripped over a tree stump. I lost my shoe. I fell onto the cold wet dirt. I was crying. I was screaming. I dug my fingers into the dirt and I clawed up this hill, pushing myself back and pushing my limbs hard into the ground to get away. I was too scared to look back lest I waste any time or distance. I reached the back door. I ripped it open. I slammed it shut behind me. I was panicking as I fumbled to lock all of the locks on the door. I was crying. I was hyperventilating. I was in absolute shock and terror. Jepsum had made her way downstairs already and she was in her bedroom when she heard me come in like straight out of a horror flick. She was confused whether this was a joke or a prank, so she began to tease me until she realized I was truly hyperventilating. My face was swollen. It was streaked with tears. My clothing was ripped, covered in dirt. And then she looked deeply concerned as she asked me, where's Anna, Suki? What happened? At that very moment, the back door began to bang and push as someone tried to come in. Instantly, Jepsum and I began screaming bloody murder when we heard Anna's voice. (laughs) It's like a horror movie. what the fuck? She was yelling this, demandingly, annoyed, but not frightened outside. Jepsum ran at the door and opened it and let Anna in, and I stayed back, still petrified and not convinced. Suki, what the actual fuck? Dude, you left your shoes, your phone's outside, and you left me, bitch. (laughs) Anna started to say, what the fuck? You left me outside. You locked the doors, which is not funny or even a good prank. That is true. That is mean to, like, have locked Anna out. She was completely obtuse to the thing that I saw outside. I stared at her, shocked. I couldn't believe that my most terrifying experience that I was still trembling from, blood pumping over, that happened like a foot away that she wasn't privy to. So much so that I'm pretty sure that she still thinks that I made up this whole thing to try to prank her for pranking Jepsum. I'm convinced it was her prank that opened some doors to access us. And there are some more stories, but perhaps I will save those for another time. But this is from Suki. Okay, that last story really spooks me out because it makes me feel like whatever Anna was doing, even though it was like a joke and a prank and jokingly communicating with something darker, demonic, triggered an actual demon to interact with Suki and terrify. Like this little ghost child sprinting at Suki, the fact that Anna had no, couldn't see it and didn't see see it happen. Right. And it's like, it's taking advantage of the situation that already happened, which is like maybe they witnessed a family or people or ghosts just like out there, but knew that Suki was a helping person Yeah, who would approach a child to see if they needed help and use that to their advantage to close the gap and distance between them before like growing and just jumping onto all fours to just <sighs> crawl after her. Ew, 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 ew. No. And also at first I was like, oh, like what if people are playing like cops and robbers or something outside? And then it turned into that, which is absolutely mm-hmm. horrifying. Terrifying. I have a short story to wrap us up on, and let's just say I picked a little bit of a theme. This is from our listener, Rachel, and it's called Crying Husband, Spooky Main Story, and Art. Hi, ghosty girlies. I am writing this after just getting home from your live show in D.C. at the Miracle Theater. Your show was amazing. I was laughing so much and gripping my husband's hand the whole time from how spooky it was. (laughs) So I found out my job is keeping like five out of the 90 people. So I won't find out if I'm laid off until next week. So I've been really nervous and stressed. And your show is just what I needed to take my mind off of things. I'm sorry. I hope it all worked out. So, okay. I have a ghost story for you guys. I'm from Lewiston, Maine, and my mom and I are pretty witchy and experienced things. When I was 15, we lived in a house that was spooky as hell. We just moved into it. My room was upstairs and my two dogs slept in the room with me the first night I was there. But they kept crying at a cubby door in my room. They'd always slept with me prior at the house we lived in before. But after that first night, they wouldn't even go up the stairs, let alone into my bedroom. They never slept with me again in that house. 
Oh my gosh. That says something. Right. That was spooky enough, but I also started having nightmares where I couldn't move or scream and I could feel an entity over my body and holding my chest. I later found out my mom was having these exact same dreams as I was. One night, I was upstairs in my room on Skype with my boyfriend, who's now my husband, and it was around midnight when I heard a loud crashing sound. I thought it was my mom and like she had dropped something, like a bunch of pots and pans. That's truly how loud it was. So I ran to the top of the stairs to check on her. And when I got there, she was at the bottom of the stairs looking up at me asking, what did you just drop? Needless to say, we were both creeped out. My stepdad is a skeptic and didn't believe me and my mom until he started hearing what sounded like furniture dragging upstairs some nights at 1 a.m. I remember a few times he would check on me and wake me up to ask why I was moving things around only to find me fast asleep in my bed. So he would look at me and be like, what the fuck? My stepdad also would hear clawing upstairs when I was not home. One night, he and my mom both heard it, and it was directly below my bedroom. My stepdad put his ear to the ceiling, and he heard a growl. (gasps) But he's a skeptic. Did it change? I don't know. Fun bonus. After we moved out, the spot where my bed was in the room caught fire. And nothing else was damaged except that very spot. Oh, my God. Thanks. I can't wait to listen to more of your episodes. And I'm the lady that drew this picture of you guys as someone about to be laid off. Let me know if you want some merch designs. Uh, And it's the one of us on the couch. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, that is from Rachel. Rachel, oh, my gosh. I need to know what what your dad's opinion of that experience was. Because to hear the growl, how can you be a skeptic after that? Well, also, thank goodness the house didn't catch fire in that spot under your bed while you lived there. I know. Rachel could have so easily just been playing right there. That makes me think too. It's like, does does Rachel have all like a team of people looking out for her against the, the weirdness that's happening in this house? And so they made sure she wasn't there when it was going to happen. Or is this sort of like just another taunt? It's like, this could be you. This could have happened to right. you. I don't know. It's fucking weird. That's so freaky. And it's also like the noise happening and both her and her mom coming to the same point to be like, did you hear that? Was that you? It's like trying to gather and lure and direct people to different places. And the and just the dogs alone. Like the dogs are, they know something's up and you got to stay Immediately. They immediately know. Trust your pets. Well, I'm glad you don't live there anymore, but I do want to know where this house is so that we can know. I want to look at the Zillow listing. It's in Maine. <laughs> Let's go visit it. Yeah, no, we can't because we're both on the East Coast. Road trip. More than that, we're both in New England. Yeah. We're both in Massachusetts. We're so, we're 30 minutes away. We're both on the North Shore. Mm. This is so exciting. It's so exciting. Okay. If any of you have any ghost stories, please email them to us at two girls, one ghost podcast at gmail.com. Spooky season is here. It is upon us. It is September, meaning it is spooky season. So please, please inundate us with your spooky stories and ghostly tales so that we can share them with you and the rest of the world and get everyone in the spooky Halloween spirit. If you want episodes ad-free and one week early, head over to our Patreon. We also go live to tell ghost stories there every Tuesday night. We have bonus episodes that come out there. We have merch discounts. We have stickers. We have a lot of delightful things over there. And when something spooky happens in the world, that's the place that we discuss as well as a place that we consume fairy smut and spooky consume. horror thriller <laughs> books with our yes. book club. Join us over there. Thank you so much to our editor and producer, Jamie Ryan, for editing our audio and video of our podcast. We're so grateful. We could not do this without you. And thank you to all of you for listening and sharing with everyone because this is a pyramid scheme and you are willingly in it. Thank you. <laughs> we love you and we will see you on the other side. side.